my privilege to introduce Lisa Reyes Mason, our speaker today. Uh, she has grown up all over this country. She has her undergraduate degree from the University of Pennsylvania with Phi Beta Kappa honors. She then went on to Washington University in St. Louis, a distinguished school, especially in social work. There she got her master's degree and her PhD. She immediately then became an assistant professor here at the University of Tennessee, and she will soon be an associate professor, but nobody knows <laughs> uh, She also, now imagine this, here she is fresh on our campus as an assistant professor, and what do they do almost immediately? They make her director of the doctoral program. Why they do that? She is phenomenally productive. Uh, just a couple of quick uh, notes on that. In 2017, she had five journal articles published and a chapter in a book. In 2018, she outdid that, five journal articles and two book chapters. In the meantime, she was preparing two books, one of which will be coming out in May that has that title on it, very attractive, and a second book is uh, in review right now, Oxford University Press. She uh, has had funding for her work uh, from National Science Foundation, National uh, Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, and the U.S. Uh, Environmental Protective Protection Agent. Ah, mm. I'll get it right. And just to add it all up, uh, she has grants that she has been principal investigator on or co-principal investigator on, totaling two and a half million dollars. I will uh, simply get out of the way <laughs> and let you have the privilege of hearing Lisa Reyes Mason. Thank you so much, Mark. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here and be part of the Science Forum, so thank you for the invitation today. So as Mark said, I am from the College of Social Work. And in, when you say social work in the public, um, people think different things. Often, right off the bat, people think about child protective services <laughs> or kids in foster care. Um, maybe substance abuse and addiction, the opioid crisis in our state. Uh, what else? What else might somebody think about with social work therapy? Maybe somebody had a therapist in private practice who was an LCSW, and that's a big part of social work. Um, but what social work really is about—it's a broader profession than just those things. Social work is really about helping people address their problems access resources and opportunities, and lead healthy and productive lives. It is fundamentally a profession that is about advancing social justice. And when we talk about social justice, we mean ensuring that everybody, and especially our most vulnerable groups of people in society, have equal or equitable access to the same rights and opportunities to live full and meaningful lives that they have reason to value. So social work has this, this bigger side to it than, than is just um, the important work of therapy and working with protective kids and protective agencies. It's really about social justice. And where I sit within social work is about uh, kind of more on the macro level, more related to community development, changing, questioning, structural inequalities in society, and that is where climate change comes in. Um, hence the title, People and Climate Change. So we know that climate change is here. Um, global average temperatures have increased already since the Industrial Revolution by about 1.8 degrees Fahrenheit, and this chart um, is a chart of atmospheric carbon dioxide concentrations. Um, if you've been following, we've actually surprisingly, given the amount of media coverage that climate change usually gets, we've had a lot of media coverage in the last few months 
um, related to climate change at the national level and even at the local levels, um, which is encouraging that it's getting more coverage. It's getting more coverage because these reports are coming out and starting to attract more attention about how far off we are from global targets of what we need to do and do quickly to reduce greenhouse gas emissions um, that are driving climate change. Um, so on the one hand, climate change is this environmental problem, and it's a technical problem that uh, requires some technical solutions to it. At the same time, we live in a deeply unequal world. And so climate change is also very much a social justice problem. The consequences of climate change for people are many, and they are inequitable in the sense that people who have done the most to contribute to the problem of climate change are the least likely. Um, the impacts that they will feel are, are disproportionate to the impacts that other more vulnerable groups of people <coughs> will feel. And the consequences of climate change touch all of these different areas. Food, water, our physical health, our mental health, our connections with other people, and our financial security. And they're purposefully interlocked here in the middle because these consequences affect each other. To just think of some examples, I did field work in the Philippines several years ago. In, up in the northern Philippines, in the mountains, there's a, a very densely populated city called Baguio City. And I studied water issues there, seasonal water issues, that were already a problem leaving weather and climate out of it because Baguio City had overgrown its capacity greatly. It was actually established at the turn of the 20th century um, as a, a kind of a resort, a cool mountainous resort for American military who were in the Philippines. So it was this resort town for 25,000 people and for Filipino elites. Um, and now it's uh, over 300,000 people live in this area that was designed for 25,000. So leave weather and climate out of it, there's already capacity problems related to water. But then you introduce changing rainfall pather patterns. You even think about the Philippines as, oh, maybe it's this, this tropical country, then there's all those hurricanes, that, the typhoons that hit the Philippines all the time. Why would there be water issues there? Well, there's changing weather patterns. And so the dry season, six months out of the year, is the dry season in a place like Baguio. Now families in Baguio City, um, only about 50% actually have water connections in their home. And when water is delivered in Baguio City, it comes three days a week for about four hours a day. So you have a water storage problem. How are you gonna store water the times that it is coming to your home, if you even have access to it, so that you can keep it and hold on to it for the rest of the week? Now, how does this relate to consequences? In these families in Baguio, it's often women who are responsible for thinking about water for their families. It becomes a mental health issue for some women, a stress issue, an emotional anxiety issue about, am I gonna be there? Can I get enough water to take care of my kids? I'm the woman, I'm responsible for bathing and cleaning and cooking. That's my kind of expression of who I am and I'm responsible for that with my family. So it's a mental health issue that also relates to hygiene and sanitation as a physical health issue, because there's no, there's not in the kind of indoor plumbing that we have here connected to a sanitation system. Um, and then am I gonna have enough water to cook the way I wanna cook, to cook rice and to cook vegetables for my family? And I might work in the informal economy. I might be going out to sell vegetables during the day. That's how I contribute to my family's income. But if I have to t plan my schedule around being home when the water may or may not come, maybe I'm gonna lose income that day and I can't provide. Um, now at the same time, social connection, do I have good enough relationships with my neighbors so that when water doesn't come or I'm not home to get it, I can ask the family next door, can I borrow some water? Can I, or can I pay you even to fill up my water bucket or my water barrel so that I have, I have access? So these consequences of changing rainfall patterns in this example in Baguio, um, they, they inter, intersect with each other, they interlock. Um, we can think of another example. Well, closer to home for me, um, my father was from outside of Chico, California, where the campfire happened. He wasn't from Paradise. He was from a couple towns over. But if you think about what happened 
with the campfire and the intersecting consequences that families who have been displaced from the campfire are going through, you can again see how these connect. So a family um, loses their home, total devastation. Let's talk about a family who survived. The home is lost, the family has to move. Where are the kids gonna go to school? Kids have, uh, in the area were out of school for a few months because there was no place to go. Um, if you have an underlying physical health condition and then there's all the smoke in the air, maybe your underlying health condition is getting even worse, let alone the mental stress and anxiety and emotional toll of, of dealing with this complete devastation. Also thinking about, I was there just a few months ago, um, when right after the campfire happened, visiting family, what is the difference? Why is it that some families are in the Walmart parking lot in tents with their kids and others are able to book hotel rooms? The hotel, I was lucky I got a hotel room for visiting family. The hotels were packed, completely sold out night after night. How did you have access? Why was the consequence worse for some families who were staying with their kids in, in what people there called refugee cities in the parking lots, whereas others had free breakfast at the Best Western while they were staying in a hotel, okay? So these are all the kinds of, of consequences of climate change that are happening on a more everyday basis um, for people. And so these are the kinds of things that I look at. Now climate change is not just a technical problem that needs technical solutions, it also very much requires social solutions. Sometimes we need social solutions in the sense of, of working with communities to adopt technology. I'll give one example in that space later on today. Um, other, ex other examples here are, uh, this is a women's cooperative in Guinea um, where they are harvest, they've, they've come together to grow and harvest this vitamin rich plant that then they can sell. So it meets some food security needs and some economic security needs in their changing climate there. On the right you see an image of a bike to school day in San Francisco. So this is a community coming together to try to reduce their own um, contribution to emissions by encouraging and even teaching kids. I don't know if you can see it, but, but the, the gentleman here is kind of helping the other two bike. So encouraging this kind of more sustainable lifestyle of walking and biking as a way to build community too, while also decreasing emissions for this one day um, and also promoting physical activity. So another example of how these are interconnected. Here you have some intergenerational community organizing going on around climate activism. Taking action on climate change doesn't always mean protests and sit-ins. It, it also very much means thoughtful, strategic, planned organizing um, to make change happen. And then on the right you have a female uh, engineer in rural India um, who wasn't an engineer until this, the UK's um, kind of equivalent of USAID um, trained rural women to become solar engineers in their communities. And so by being these local solar engineers, they can bring economic development to their communities, to their families, and contribute to drawing down emissions. So just a few examples of how solving climate change isn't just about the technical side, it's about the socio-technical side and the social side as well. And just by the way, since there are some communications and journalism folks here, these images are from a site called Climate Visuals, which is a great website to check out if this is a space you're interested in, because Climate Visuals is all about trying to change how climate change is represented in the media, um, using evidence-based practices to, to try to, try to, I think, try to, in some cases, like these, try to plant hope. Uh, sometimes climate change feels so daunting, addressing, for some people, it feels so daunting, and one of the things Climate Visuals is trying to do is make these images more accessible to, to people to use, um, and to change the story about it. So what do we need to do? Well, this is my research agenda, but I think it's what, what many of us need to do. We need to think about understanding better the human consequences of climate change. We need to protect, in particular, vulnerable or marginalized groups from these consequences. And ultimately, we also need to transform 
to a more sustainable world. So why not dream big at the UT Science Forum on this beautiful Friday? Yes? Just a quick one. What was the name of that site again? Climate Visuals. Mm -hmm. That's a good chance for me to take a drink of water anyway. Thank you. So I try to go about my work on people and climate change by embracing kind of these um, principles, or I guess this is my approach to how I do my work. I do it in a very multidisciplinary way that involves meaningful engagement with communities because I really believe in gathering local perspectives and understanding local perspectives. I was actually at University of Pennsylvania. I had three different minors, um, but I, my major was in folklore and folk life. Yeah. Uh, and people often, for uh, kind of like social work, you know, what do you think of when you say folklore? You think legends and myths and tall tales, but folklore is really about the folk or the everyday people and their lore or their knowledge. It's really about the wisdom and knowledge of everyday people and how they share that and how they transmit it. And so I think I've always kind of been in this space of wanting to um, tackle bigger problems, but in a very local way. And then trying to, to craft my work in a way that it has action and impact beyond just the, the journal articles and the books that it, that in addition to those, um, which I need for my promotion, um, and to be seen as an expert who gets invited to different tables, that I try to build in partnerships that lead to action and impact. So I'll give some examples of that also. Okay, so the, the rest of the talk is kind of giving you a feel for some of the things I do locally that speak to people and climate change issues. I mentioned that my work is very multidisciplinary. To, to any of the students in the room or graduate students who might be thinking about their next step in their career, you know, when I was on the job market looking for a faculty position, I was very intentional about trying to find a place where collaboration was supported. And during my visit to the University of Tennessee I, as a faculty candidate, I really felt that. And it has been, a, for me, a very collaborative place to work. There's a good bit of luck in the story of the collaborations that I've built. Uh, almost literally from day one, new faculty orientation. I met, uh, I was in line for lunch and a woman behind me was talking about how she had just eloped down in the Smoky Mountains and gotten married and I never knew anybody who had eloped and so I caught my ear and we started talking. Well, it turned out she was a brand new applied climatologist in geography. Her name is Kelsey Ellis. Um, and so I'm applied climatologist. Oh, I'm studying the social side of climate change. So, so we obviously connected right away. At that same lunch, we saw Chris Cox, who was then the director of the Institute for Secure and Sustainable Environment here on campus. And we went up to him to introduce ourselves to him. And he introduced us to John Hathaway, brand new civil and environmental engineer. And so right away, we made the connection. Now, it sounds like a great lucky story, right? It is. There was a good bit of luck involved, but it also involved a mindset, a mindset of really wanting to tackle these problems as a team. Um, because that's what, I think that's what we need, is this team science to address something as quote unquote wicked as climate change. It's not just one discipline or sector or community who's gonna really make a difference here. It's teams coming together. And so the three of us have partnered since the beginning and then that has spiraled out into lots of other collaborations on campus as well. I put this slide up here about communication because that's one thing that we have, have learned about doing this work is how important it is to communicate clearly with each other, to be humble in asking questions about terms, the other person's work, what it means. Um, when one of the first projects we did was on urban microclimates here in Knoxville. So we were interested, especially in the, the question of the urban heat island. So um, would we find evidence in Knoxville where um, temperatures might vary. You know, you pull up the weather channel on your phone and it gives you the airport basically reading for the temperature um, for the most part of Knoxville. We were interested in more downscaled, more localized data to see would we find different, different temperature patterns in Knoxville. Um, why does that matter? Because if you actually have a difference in neighborhood, you often find that it's in your, your um, often in many cities, 
you're more urban, which often in many cities have higher concentrations of poverty, these neighborhoods that have more of what we call the built environment, less trees, less green, and therefore often hotter temperatures, even by just a couple degrees than maybe a neighborhood that has more shade, um, just a, maybe more of a spread out development pattern. So we were interested in studying, was there an urban heat island effect even in Knoxville? I put this slide up because it speaks to communication and collaboration and I think the importance of having a social scientist on the team, if I say so myself. Because when we were first talking about where to place our sensors, which is what these are, and I'll show a picture of the sensors in the next slide, um, John and Kelsey, we were all new to Knoxville, John and Kelsey from kind of the hard science side um, thought that it'd be perfectly fine if we just had three locations around town. That was the variation that they needed in order to answer their hard science questions. So I said, well, wait a sec, we're new here. Let's learn a little bit more about the lay of the land. Let's go talk to people. So I made a point of talking to the Office of Neighborhoods, talking to a local nonprofit, talking to a local expert in program evaluation who said, hey, you cannot leave out South Knoxville. If you leave out South Knoxville and you're trying to do a city, a study about Knoxville, that doesn't make any sense for, for where you are now. And so, so that willingness as a team to kind of say, okay, hey, I have a different thought than you, and the willingness of them to say, okay, Lisa, that's fine, go talk to the people you wanna talk to, and then let us know. Um, but, but then they became convinced, like, okay, yes, let's add South Knoxville in. So what we did with this initial, initial project was we put out these these sensors that the engineering team built. Here's one of the, the students in engineering installing our sensor. Um, and it was basic. It collected temperature data in five minute increments, uh, relative humidity, a few other things. Um, we also did um, a bunch of qualitative interviews, uh, about, about, about 20, I should say, 20 qualitative interviews with residents in our four study neighborhoods. Um, and we eventually did a couple of surveys as well with this work. We were interested in understanding the urban heat island, but also any other environmental problems um, that might vary around town or people's experience of which might vary, whether they were related to climate or not. As you'll see, several of them ended up being related to climate change, even though people would not, use, would not talk about it in their lives as being climate change. So this is um, one example of a quote from one of our interviews where people started talking about the economic effects of extreme weather. So a participant in Lonsdale who said, there's several people in this neighborhood. They have a hard time, so they ration themselves with energy use because they're on a fixed income. And a lot of them fall into the category of I've got just enough that I can't get help, but not enough that I can be comfortable. So you see this intersection between, um, let's say this is summer that the person was talking about, a, a, a stream of hot days, a heat wave, where there's people in this neighborhood that this person knows about who feel like they can't make that trade-off between their comfort and possibly their health and the stress of their finances of turning on their air conditioner. One thing that this participant also talked about that's really important is she talked about how sometimes she makes a point of going out and visiting the older adults in her neighborhood who she knows are making this choice. And she tries to herself and a couple other neighbors bring them fans and then tries to make sure that they're using the fans. So it speaks to the idea of social capital, which we'll talk about a little bit later. So this is a reality for, for a lot of people in Knoxville, making choices about, I can't afford to have a higher utility bill. And so I'm just gonna have to suffer through this heat wave um, and potentially risk my health or my family's health because of it. We had a participant in Vestal. We did research in the Montgomery Village public housing community in Vestal. And this participant spoke about, and this junkyard over here kills me because they have, they burn stuff or something. But some days it is really bad over here and it smothers me to death. I can't come outside sometimes and I can smell it inside the house. So you have some air quality concerns, which you also had over in Lonsdale too, people talking about air pollution nearby, and in part, air pollution from a local factory, um, but people also expressing hesitancy. They didn't necessarily want to go question too much what was going on 
at this local company. Why? Because the company invests in the community. The company hires people from the neighborhood. The company gives backpacks to Lonsdale Elementary. The company brings Christmas presents to the school every year. And so there's this kind of this tension between, we're not sure, there's some air quality concerns that we have, but gosh, they're also helping us in these other ways. And so what do you do with that? This participant talked about looking out of her front yard, looking out on a park, a park that's known for high drug and crime activity, but also saying, I think all neighborhoods need trees. She's looking out at, at her space that she finds beauty from. The park, oh, it's so pretty in late evening and I can open my door and see the light through the trees. And I think it's, it's important. It looks good for a neighborhood to have trees. And there's all this research now about the effects of green space on your mental health. And when we think about addressing in part some climate change issues through more green space, whether that's you're adding green space um, to try to address temperature effects or to as a form of green infrastructure to deal with heavy rains, which I'll give an example of, there's potentially also these mental health benefits for people and a question of equity and access. Um, how beautiful is my neighborhood compared to how beautiful your neighborhood is? Do we all deserve the right to have what we find to be a beautiful neighborhood. And then this participant in Burlington who makes a comparison, what she sees as inequitable action um, from the city, this is her perspective in addressing environmental issues in, and other issues in her neighborhood versus West Knoxville. She says, we're a black guy, we get nothing out here. Our streets never get repaired. We never see a policeman like just ride through the neighborhood, let the children get familiar with him. But now West Knoxville, they get everything. They, I mean, I rode down through there the other day, smooth as silk, the streets are. So a perception of, of access to city investment. Now you talk about this with the city because I have relationships with Aaron Gill at the sustainability office and folks at the neighborhood office. They will tell you that they, they act fairly and they know there's a perception issue, but the perception, regardless of, of who owns the truth here, um, the perception is there and, and that's something to be dealt with regardless. I think I'll skip this for the sake of time um, and tell you about one other part of this project, which was we did a survey to ask people about their health, the health impacts of weather extremes. So we're really interested in climate change and health, but we didn't call it climate change because again, that's not how every day people are thinking about, oh, climate change is affecting my health, right? But people are thinking about summer heat Summer, how the summer heat wave might affect me, or extreme winter weather, which people don't always realize. Some winter extremes um, are potentially being linked to climate change as well. So we focused specifically on lower and moderate income neighborhoods in Knoxville. Why? When you are in the space of people in climate change, there's a lot of what are called social vulnerability studies of climate change. And a lot of counties or regions will do vulnerability analyses to um, draw on census data and other data to kind of create these maps of, of where is the socioeconomic vulnerability in our community and where are the people who are gonna be most affected. We know, we know already that, that um, it's in a, one of those communities is our poorer communities. So our team was not interested in kind of reproducing another vulnerability analysis, but starting with our lower SES areas here in town and seeing what would we learn from residents there. So we conducted our survey in the red, orange, and yellow census tracts with the exception of uh, basically of UT census tracts because this we believe is student income data and it was not the population that we were targeting for our study. Um, but these are census tracts where the area median income, uh, where the is where the, the household median income for that census tract is at or below Knoxville's area median. So at or below about $33,000 per year. That's what these census tracts represent. Um, and so we asked people about how their health was affected. And then we were interested in different kinds of capitals, whether certain kinds of human, financial, physical, and social capital might be protective, might be explaining 
um, why some people have better or worse health impacts. So what did we find in this sample? We had about 442 respondents to this survey. Uh, about three quarters in summer and about two thirds in win for winter said they had some kind of physical health impact. Let me give one other back part of this study. One other reason we did this study is that what we do know about linkages between health and climate are often the most severe outcomes. Mortality, psychiatric admission, things that are coming from secondary public health data from hospitals um, or clinics. That's really important information, but we know that, not ev that there's all these other other impacts that might be happening before you get to that level. And not everybody has the same kind of access to go and be seen when they're having some kind of health issue. And so that's part of why we wanted to ask people about other health impacts, not just the most severe ones. So three quarters and two thirds reported some kind of physical health impact. And then about half of our sample reported some kind of mental health impact in either summer or winter. So a common experience. What are some examples? People said, my lungs can't take it. It plays havoc with my COPD. There's breathing problems for my grandson with asthma. I get less exercise because the heat seems to sap my energy. <coughs> my arthritis worsens. I slipped on the ice and broke my wrist. Depression from not being able to get out. I gave a talk on part of this study recently and somebody reached out to me afterwards and so these are the moments that really matter to you where you feel like something you did or said actually you can see a concrete change in the world somebody reached out to me afterward and said you know I've noticed that my elderly father-in-law this happens to him in the winter I'm gonna make sure that next time I we reach out much more proactively to him to make sure even if he's rejecting we still are gonna try to keep reaching out um, to give him social support when these winter extremes happen. When we look statistically at the relationship between these possible protective factors and health, now we can't truly call them protective factors because it's a cross-sectional point in time study. It's not a longitudinal analysis that really lets us get at cause and effect. But when we look at that, we find um, two very consistent findings across the analyses, which is that the better your kind of baseline health is, um, the more good health status you have to begin with, then the fewer physical or mental health impacts you have. Makes sense, very logical, right? That if you think about it worded the opposite way, if you have some underlying health issue or that you are uh, more likely to see that get exacerbated in summer heat or winter extremes. And so again, it kind of clues us into who's already vulnerable. How do we make sure that, that we, we protect these folks even further as these weather extremes happen? And then the other one, um, the only other one that we found a relationship for, but which was consistent across all of our, our analyses was social cohesion. So that social connectedness that you have with others being this protective factor. So the more social cohesion you have, then the less physical health and mental health impacts you're having. Um, so it points to um, the potential role of building social capital as one place to intervene. So in my field in social work, in our journal articles, we always are revising resubmissions, are always, always tell us more about your practice and policy and research implications in all three spaces. And you don't wanna to say too much because you don't wanna overclaim what you can recommend. Um, but these are just a couple of the implications from this work that for our social work and allied professionals to do more, to build social capital proactively, um, to pursue efforts around integrated healthcare and healthcare access. If you don't know what integrated healthcare is, the real two second, five second version is it's the idea of co-locating health and mental health services in the same place 
So you might see your primary care provider and as they're doing their assessment of you, they realize there's a mental health issue going on right away. That same day, same appointment, they can connect you maybe with a social worker, a counselor, so that you're not, again, kind of juggling all these different appointments, being referred to somebody else. Maybe you don't follow through on it. So pushing for more integrated health care um, and climate change being another reason to push for that because people are having physical health and mental health impacts that can feed off of each other. And then interestingly, there's very little research done on winter extremes. I think summer heat is the more, more interesting one. Maybe it's the, the uh, one we see more of in the news, but there is a need to study more of, of these impacts of winter extremes, also because we're seeing more of that, even though we have, again, kind of this, this trend of, of uh, well, I won't bring up politics, okay. Um, of, temperatures increasing overall, you have more precipitation in the air. When you do get severe weather in winter, the chances of you having heavier snow, ice storms, and those incidents being worse when they do happen is the issue with winter extremes, the severity of those kinds of incidents. Okay, I'm gonna have to make choices. Probably prepared too much. Because um, I know Mark said that this group likes to ask questions. So, um, let me give you one other example. I have two coming up. They're both in the space of urban flooding. So this is another area of people and climate change I work on. Infrastructure, stormwater infrastructure in a lot of our cities is failing. The American Society of Civil Engineers rates this kind of infrastructure in the US as a D plus. So A, we have an infrastructure problem. B, it's too costly to just go replace it all. And C, we're seeing trends of, of more precipitation or heavier precipitation when it happens. So more risk of flooding in a lot of areas. Um, and flooding is one of the leading causes, and flooding and flash floods are one of the leading causes of weather-related fatalities. So it's also a public health and a social issue to be concerned about. I think I'll talk about the smart stormwater one real quick as my example here. So this is one of our National Science Foundation projects where it's a good example of the socio-technology um, aspect of this work. So the technology now exists to use and install sensors um, in existing stormwater infrastructure systems to install sensors that monitor water flow in real time and to feed that back to an operator who can then control, if you install, let's say, the system of valves and gates on existing stormwater infrastructure, to control how that water flows through the infrastructure in a city, let's say, in real time. So if you know that you tend to have flooding problems in this part of the city, you can, with smart stormwater technology in real time, change where some of that water flows and where it's held in a city, so maybe it's gonna be held in a detention pond that hasn't really been used very much in the past. Now, what that means on the social side is people might start to see change that they're not used to. How many of you drive by, uh, are familiar with, um, it's kind of that wetland looking thing by Morell, and it's in West Knoxville, by Morell and, uh, Westland, I think, or Gleason. Anyway, by one of the apartment comp complexes out by the mall there, there's kind of that little wetland. And sometimes it looks really beautiful, and other times it looks really mucky. You're like, what's going on there? Um, that's kind of, it, that's not a smart stormwater example, but it's related to some of these social questions we have. If we use this technology to help prevent flooding, are people going to say, wait a sec, are you diverting water to my neighborhood? in my space, and now there's going to be, you're helping another part of the community, but you're flooding me out, or it looks like you're flooding me out, or it's changing the way my neighborhood looks. Um, we've talked to families who have legitimate concerns about if you're going to raise the level of water in this detention pond, I want you, it needs to be protected from my kids. My kids like to roam around the neighborhood and I don't want them drowning. Or are there going to be more mosquitoes? Are there going to be more insect problems? So there's a lot of these social questions related to 
adoption, potential adoption of smart stormwater technology um, that require social scientists to come to the table along with the engineers who are responsible for, for kind of deploying the technology. So it's another space um, that we're working in to try to get more towards the other two things about protecting groups of people from consequences and transforming us to a more sustainable world. So I hope just with these few examples that you can see how, at least the space I work in on people and climate change, it's very interdisciplinary. It's very um, local and engaged with communities. And it also, uh, what I haven't talked much about yet is the action and impact part. How does our team go about trying to make some kind of difference that, is, that goes beyond the academic um, present, presentations and publications? And so one way we do that is really by trying to build into each project um, partnerships from beginning to end. So with the first example of urban microclimates, one of our partners was the Public Housing Tenant Association in Montgomery Village. It became a very rich partnership that led to other things beyond our climate and environmental issues. The association, uh, after, after they were interviewed by us, they got interested in doing a survey of their own community there in Montgomery Village. So we worked with them to do their own survey. They, they presented their work at the city's annual neighborhoods conference. Um, and then we were also able to tell the story of this project through the media, trying to raise public awareness about these issues locally. With our health impacts of weather extreme study, we made sure to involve other people in even the creation of that survey from the beginning. So asking Office of Neighborhoods, the Sustainability Office, a local environmental group to weigh in on what questions we were asking about because we wanted the information not only to fill a gap in the academic literature, but to answer also practical questions for our potential partners. And then the City Sustainability Office was able to use some of our results to inform their regional hazard mitigation plan and we were also able to use it in a local op-ed talking about the importance of engaging people in how cities go about planning for climate change. I put this up here because I think it's really important that academics also try to have action, have impact by having a public voice. So personally, I do my best to try to respond when there are media invitations. Sometimes it feels very scary and daunting. Um, and other times it feels like, oh, well, I have other things to do and, and I don't know. But I, I have found that as I've started to get more involved in it, it's just it's another chance to influence the story, influence what is being said about climate change. Um, I was thrilled to have our local media reach out recently about climate change because it's, it is getting more and more covered in the news, not just on a national level, but here in our city and state as well. So all in all, looking ahead, this is what I plan to do. I hope it's what some of you will plan to do as well, which is when you think about people and climate change, to remember to have at least part of the work have a focus on equity, and social justice when it comes to climate change issues. To help us all pursue resilience to weather extremes that are already happening, and then to use our work to inform climate action at all levels. Is it about eventually, well hopefully sooner rather than later, but I'm not sure how realistic it is, informing federal policy around climate action? Absolutely, but there's a lot that can be done at state and local levels as well in the meantime. Um, and so I think that's an important thing to consider. Okay, questions, I didn't do too bad, 10 minutes.